I'm Scott L. Miller, and this is my expat life in Latin America. For a lot of you who are looking at becoming expats, there's a lot of excitement and a lot of reasons to be really hyped up and ready to jump in and most likely you should. Get your research done, get out there and give it a try. Becoming an expat is one of the best things that many people will ever do. It's a literally life-changing event in every possible way, but there are risks and caveats to being an expat. And there are some that I think people don't think about and in fact completely gloss over because it's a type of change in your life that you may never make any other time. And there's a lot to really step back and think about before you make too many decisions. So some of those dangers and warnings we're going to talk about today's show. Some of the biggest challenges that you're going to have becoming an expat is that you are giving up, most likely, in almost all cases, a lifetime of integration into a place. For me, that was Western New York in the Rochester and Buffalo areas. I grew up there. I spent my entire childhood there. I went to elementary and high school there and did a significant portion of my college and uni there. So I also had a lot of career time, both in just doing regular jobs and in an actual professional career. So I really really got to know all aspects of society and the ecosystems and had worked with government and being an employer and an employee, a child and an adult. I knew people from my hometown, from farms from far away. I had friends and connections all over the place. And this is natural for most people growing up in any given place. It doesn't matter where you're from. If you, if you grew up in a singular single place, you probably have a lot of deep connections. And if you grew up within one culture but moved around a lot, you still probably have a lot of deep-seated connections to people spread out, maybe not quite as much, but you probably also still have a very deep understanding of culture and mechanisms of government and place and so forth. For example, if anything was ever to happen, as simple as there being a house fire, I know exactly who to call. If a cat is stuck up in a tree, I know what to do. If someone is attacked by a dog, I know exactly how to respond. In basically everything that could happen uh, in day-to-day -day life, I know exactly what number to call, what to say to them, what to expect them to do, how to behave. All those things become intrinsic. We're taught them from very small childhood. Even really small children know to call 911 and more or less what to say and how to behave. We know what we're expected to do when we go to a hospital or visit a government office. Maybe small children don't know how to do those things, but young adults do. Knowing how to deal with lawyers or rent or any number of things. And there's many, many, many things that we do every day that we take for granted that are different than they are done in other parts of the world or maybe aren't different, but we don't know that they're not different and would pose some amount, not an insurmountable, but some amount of challenge should we move to a new place. Now, for people like me, I really enjoy the challenge of everyday life. I don't like having all those connections and simplicity caused by knowing the same thing my whole life and making everything repetitive. I really enjoy going to a new place and having to learn how to read money again and the language again and exactly what shopping is like and how to ask for things when I go different places. And yes, it's frustrating at times, but it's also exciting. I'm getting to experience a completely different life than the one I grew up with. And so it can be an amazing thing. And it's a huge part of the aspect of becoming an expat. Now for probably the majority of people, those are things they have to put up with, but maybe they're kind of interesting. For me, they're truly exciting. But it goes much deeper than that. When you're in a new place, you give up all those connections and familiarity. And so one of the big challenges that expats often don't think about is the the really nuanced portions of life that they're not going to be prepared for. When you're a tourist and you're visiting a place, it could be anywhere. You're going to Cancun, you're going to the south of France, you're going to Argentina, you're going to go watch some uh, tango shows, you're going to go uh, get tapas in southern Spain. Many of those things are designed around the needs of tourists and they're very uh, hand-holding in general and the people dealing with you really understand that you're not a local and you're not of that place and they're there to take care of you because 
because you're a guest specifically paying more than normal for a uh, visitor's experience, for a view into the lives of people there to do something interesting. And that's fantastic and people love it and, and that's a wonderful thing about travel. But when you move past travel and you want to become an expat, things start to change. Your mechanisms have to adjust a little bit. You, under normal circumstances, can't spend all of your time in that travel mode. You can't always be a tourist in both because you can't afford it or it would be impractical or you wouldn't enjoy that life, but also because at some point it's just not really touristy anymore. Like it will wear on you and you will become very disappointed in that life over time. It's not something that's designed from a mental perspective to be maintained. It's an aside, not your main life. If you were a tourist as your main life, you would actually find very large portions of it to be incredibly annoying. The amount of time you have to wait for things, the incredibly high cost for things, the uh, lack of control of your schedule, the go, go, go from one activity to another, they are all fun when you're on vacation and it's a temporary thing, but they're all pretty grating when they're every day and you have to wait or pay extra when you just want to get things done. You just want to grab a quick, quick snack, not spend too much money and move on with your day because you have things you want to do. Very few of those kinds of things pose any degree of danger. Those aren't, aren't things that we're worried about when we're becoming expats. That's fine. Where we have to actually identify some amount of risk is much more in our understanding of emergency services, legal services, and our connections and social knowledge of people and, and those types of connections. Even if you are a very poorly connected person in the place that you're coming from, you likely have a lot of information about who you need to talk to for different things, how they are done and so forth. And even if you are unconnected yourself, the chances that you're not connected to someone who has enough connections to generally be able to help you at least figure out what you need to do in an emergency situation is, is very low. You almost certainly have those people at your disposable disposal in one way or another. Uh, and, and in many cases, you don't need them. You know exactly what to do. If you have a run-in with the law, you know that you need a lawyer and when to reach out to them. If you're going to deal with the police, you know exactly how to interact. You know what they're supposed to do. You know what you're supposed to do. There are social constructs that guide you through these processes. Yeah, in some cases, you can act outside those social constructs, uh, constructs, but you know what they are and you know when you're violating them and going out on a limb versus being normal. When you're in a new country, all those things become very, very unknown. You don't know exactly how to deal with emergency services. You may not know how to reach them. You may not know what your rights are. A lot of those simple things like this is legal and that is not become, I don't actually know, right? It's amazing how often people coming from North America, for example, are shocked to learn that you can walk down the street with a beer here. I live in Nicaragua. No one thinks twice. Of course you can walk on the street with a beer. Why would you not be able to do that? But then they're also shocked that there's no tolerance for drunk driving. What, what do you mean? I only had X number. Well, the, the number you're allowed to have is zero. They're like, what? You're, you're not allowed some before you drive? Like, because both things are opposite of the place that they're coming from. I'm not saying one is better or worse. I'm saying that they're different, different in an in inconsistent way. So it's easy to see that being unaware of of what a law may be or what a requirement may be can happen just so easily. Then, of course, by being an expat, you're just in general in a little bit more danger because you don't know what's expected, you don't know what you're supposed to do, you don't know when you're supposed to do it. All those things make things just a little bit riskier. These things add up when you're in a new place, you're likely to be doing things you wouldn't normally do, you're trying new things, you're experimenting with life in many cases, and you're trying to learn a new place, and you don't necessarily have great resources for that. Even if you were moving to the United States, where I'm from, you know, there's a lot of things I know intrinsically because people tell you, but I have no idea how someone who didn't have family resources would ever find out certain things. And still, Americans are constantly amazed by laws they had no idea about, like very... Very few Americans are familiar with the drinking laws. At what age can you drink? Most Americans don't know. They think they're just say 21. They don't realize that that's under very specific circumstances and that it's not federal and that it can change and that it's local and that some places are dry. Like there's so much complication to a place you're familiar with. The amount of complication in a place you're not familiar with is obviously exactly the same, just you're not familiar. And so that's, it's so easy to see why so many people are confused about the laws of their own country to then be, a, you know, really aware of laws of a new country would be amazing. It'd be very, very difficult to do. 
So you have this combination of not having a lot of information and, and kind of looking to do new things combined with not having a lot of resources. So you don't have people to guide you in much of any way. Of course, you can look around and see what other people are doing and that helps a little bit, but you don't want to live that kind of life for very long. You want to be able to feel free to do your own thing and you want to know what is and isn't allowed or what is and isn't expected. You don't just want to know what's legal. You also want to know about faux pas and expectations and, and politeness, right? And you may not always want to be polite or whatever, but you want to be impolite only intentionally, not without being aware of it, right? So there's a there's an important balance there. The third thing that really becomes a major risk is that as an expat, you become an obvious target for people who know that you don't have the first two things. You don't know what you're doing and you don't have access to people who do in most cases. So you become an obvious target to take advantage of, whether it is to simply trick you into buying something you shouldn't do, getting you to invest in something that doesn't make sense, or tricking you in some much more nefarious way uh, and potentially extorting you or doing something really terrible or potentially potentially, you know, robbing you or something, knowing that you probably don't know who to call or, or what to do and, and think that you'll probably panic. And it's common, right? It's really common for expats to run into some kind of stressful situation, whatever that is, and then to flee the country rather than facing it. So someone who's committing a crime will often take a risk because the chances that they will get away with it with an expat is so much higher. The expat won't know whether they are or are not a member of the community in most cases. They won't know where to go. They won't be able to respond as quickly. They won't be able to communicate as quickly. And all of this is before we deal with any potential additional problems, like maybe you don't know the local language. Maybe you do. Maybe you expatted to a country with the same language, or maybe you're fluent in the one that you moved to. But that you lack these resources. It, it's a cumulative effect. And so it's really common. And here in Nicaragua, we talk about this all the time, especially in areas like San Juan del Sur, where there are so many expats and it has a bunch of factors going for it. It's a bunch of expats together. It's where expats tend to move first. If they're going to move on somewhere else, often they go there first. So it's an opportunity for someone who wants to do something less than friendly to find expats who are not uh, well connected with people, not been around for very long, don't know what is normal and what isn't, don't know what to look out for, don't know how likely a scam is or whatever, and are, are much more likely uh, to make good, uh, easy pickings for someone looking to do something, something bad. And, uh, uh, and it, it's because San Juan del Sur has so many people in that situation, it creates its own problems. You have all these people who don't have resources because they're near each other. And this creates what we know as the enclave effect, right? In enclaves, the more of an enclave area that you're in, the less likely you are for that enclave to have resources. And the less likely you are in that enclave to have resources. As a group, it's the least resourceful group. Right. They may have financial resources, maybe, but they almost certainly don't have the right. They don't know how to find a good lawyer. They don't know how to find, uh, a, you know, the police. They don't know how to call an ambulance. Some of those things they will know how to do, but they won't have the collective knowledge in the way that a normal village would. So you basically have an easily identified gap of knowledge. Oh, here is an entire area where this person is not going to have a neighbor who doesn't have a neighbor who doesn't have a neighbor who has any experience or knowledge here. And that's why they're there in most cases. Now, there's going to be an exception. They're taking a risk, of course. Maybe you do know someone and you just like living in that community, but it's not the norm. They know that their chances are much better. If you go into a small city somewhere else in the country and you find that one expat who's living there, there's a really good chance that that expat knows someone, is married to someone, you know, it, like no knows what they're doing because it's 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 few and far between the number of expats who stay outside the enclave. So they become basically the same risk more or less as everyone else in society. But when you go after an enclave, you have a self-selected group of people who are almost certainly not very knowledgeable about what the law is and how to get the right resources to help you uh, and often go to each other so can end up in a feedback loop of being told bad information by other people who, well, I heard this and I heard this and it becomes an easy to manipulate group in general. So rumors and misinformation tend to take uh, root very quickly 
because everyone is lacking the ability and the resources to fact check things. Ooh, I heard, right? I heard the Panama, the Panama, the Nicaragua Canal was really moving forward. Ooh, I heard that too. Of course, they all heard it from the same one person lying to one person, and it spreads through the community until they're telling each other the same thing. And so they're ending up verifying each other in a big circle with no source. And that kind of stuff happens all the time. This is the expectation. This is the norm, not the exception. And so uh, you have to really, really be careful when moving into a new country and be aware of these risks and be aware of what it could potentially take to mitigate them. Now, all of these we're going to break down. We're going to put into our uh, longer form uh, expat skills uh, playlist that we're working on where we talk about all these things and like what you need to do when you move to a country or what you need to intentionally avoid, uh, you know, or, or think about uh, whether or not it's something you want to do. But a lot of people have talked to me recently about some expats who are in a dangerous situation, and I'm not going to go into any details or talk about anything with them until at least their story is completely told and we know what happened, and then we can talk about specifics potentially. And uh, obviously it's a very sensitive situation, and they're not divulging very much, so it looks like we're going to have very little to work with. But there, there are some real dangers that I think uh, this highlights, and things that we tend to assume people know, but in reality they probably don't. Okay, so likely all of that makes perfect sense. And you're like, Scott, I get it. Yeah, we're missing all these resources that we're used to. What's the answer? What do you do as an expat when you're coming to a new country and you're not going to have these things? And obviously you don't want to be in a heightened level of danger. What do you do? Well, there's no simple answer to this, unfortunately, but there are some really basic things. And I mean, at the beginning, it's all about understanding what your risks are are start to identify the things that you need to know and we're going to help with uh, our channel on both the playlist for expats in general and here on the channel for skills in Nicaragua and quite often when people are having issues here in Nicaragua I'm like you know we have a video that talks about that people are like oh I didn't look for that because we have 3,000 videos 4,000 videos so of course you don't know what to look for but they're often out there and often they're not it depends what the issue is but one of the first things is when you're moving to a new country, you need to make some decisions. And part of that decision that should be considered is, do you want to reduce that danger? But you, in order to do that, you need to be integrating into society. Or are you willing to accept that extra danger and you're willing to live in an enclave? And this is something that people have to consider as part of that enclave life decision. And it doesn't mean an official enclave, but any time where you're living set apart. It could be as simple as I'm moving to the beach and I'm only going to hang out with other expats. It's not actually an enclave. It's just a spot loaded with Nicaraguans or what, whoever in, in your particular case with people who are not expats. But I'm going to seek out expats, especially those from my home country, my home language, and we're going to hang out. And that's just what I'm going to do because I'm not really looking to learn the language or learn the local culture or whatever. And obviously there's nothing wrong with that. But in doing that, quite often you're going to be hanging out with other people like yourself who don't have a lot of resources. And it's kind of like a bunch of people on permanent vacation. And vacation does come with some dangers. We normally accept this when we're traveling, but it's for very short term. Sure, you're a little bit more likely to get pickpocketed. You're a little bit more likely to get scammed. But we're on like high alert because we're on vacation. It's not generally too big of a deal. And we know we're only on vacation for one to four weeks. That's about it. So you're generally like, okay, I can handle a little bit of extra. I know things could go wrong. I've only ever once been pickpocketed. It was on vacation. I've only ever once had my credit card skimmed, it was on vacation, like a lot of those types of things, we're like, oh yeah, there are things that happen when you're on vacation. Well, if you live in permanent vacation mode, which is what enclave living is kind of like, you take on that extra level of risk. Generally, it's not too bad, but it's really something you have to consider. And is enclave living something you're willing to, to compromise that safety on? Right. Is that a trade off that you're willing to make? And for a lot of people, it is. And people do this every day. Right. Enclave living is a very, very, very normal thing for people to do when they're moving to a new country. They're not choosing the country because they want to change their culture. They're choosing because they need, you know, a different cost of living or a different freedom or a different uh, health care provider or different weather or whatever, different location. So they have reasons that they're willing to do it and they want to be in an enclave because they didn't want to leave what they had behind. They want to bring as much of it with them. They like you know, friends and family and lifestyle and that stuff, but they want to do it in a different place or at a different time of day or, or with a different weather or whatever. Right. So that makes sense. 
if that's something you want, you just have to accept the fact that you're in a position where you have fewer resources and you are a little bit more on your own. Uh, because if you were living in, say, the United States or Canada or something, and you, and you knew of someone who had an enclave, well, there's this group of people from somewhere else. They're expats, immigrants. You would call them up there, but that's not correct, right? In the same situation, it would just be expats. Expats living in some you know, commune somewhere. They don't talk to anyone. They don't know anybody. They're not, they don't speak the language, but you know, they don't cause any problems. You'd be like, well, yep. Uh, you know, you'd be suspicious of them and you know that they would have, uh, you know, issues with things. They, they wouldn't know how to call the police. They wouldn't know, they wouldn't, you, they just wouldn't have resources. They wouldn't have the social knowledge that you would expect to have. Well, you're going to be that person in this new country. And so you have to think of it in that context. For other people, they come and they don't want to have that. Maybe it's because they want to be, don't want to be risky. Maybe it's for other reasons. But for a lot of people, they don't want that enclave life. And it's worth, uh, so if you are going to be in that enclave, you have to go out of your way to specifically line up having a lawyer or, or a group of lawyers, accountants, um, make sure you, you understand how to interact with different uh, uh, emergency services, hire someone uh, to guide you or whatever. You need to make a really conscious effort to overcome these gaps and you'll never completely overcome them, but you can overcome a lot of them, right? You can have your ducks in a row and have resources lined up so that you know what to do when something goes wrong. And honestly, like if, you know, People say, I have to have a lawyer in a new country? I'd have a lawyer in America. Why would it be different somewhere else? Right? Can you live with that one? Of course you can. Should you? No. No place is really designed for you never to have access to a lawyer. So finding resources like that, uh, have a, find a general practitioner, right? Go find a doctor who's going to guide you in things. So many people ask me, where do I get this? Where do I get this with medical? And I try to help when I can. But in reality, if you're here, unless you're living in my town, my resources aren't going to help you that much, right? But if you're going to be in whatever town and you want to be able to have access to all these different resources, much the way that I have access, you find a general practitioner in most cases, and they will guide you to all, you know, oh, I got a foot doctor you can use. Oh, I've got a psychiatrist you can use, whatever. They will guide you to the right people. That's, that's part of their job. And of course, you can ask at a pharmacy, you can ask at the hospital, there's, there's, but start asking. You got to put these pieces together. You got to find these resources. You have to assemble your ecosystem and you will always be short a little bit. If you're integrating into society, a lot of this stuff starts coming naturally, right? If you're becoming part of a community, you're going to have neighbors who are like, you know, we have lawyers and stuff, and you're, you're going to develop trusted friends. When you're in an enclave, even if you trust your neighbors and stuff, that they may not have any knowledge or resources that you don't have. So the amount that you trust them may be irrelevant. They don't have the basis for comparison. They can be like, oh, I use this person. They're great. Ever heard that about a real estate agent? You're going to hear it constantly. Then you find out that the person saying it got ripped off, but they didn't evaluate it themselves or they're embarrassed and didn't want to mention it. Normally they're being honest that they didn't know, but they're just, they got a bad deal. They didn't know. They passed them on to you. Now everybody's giving a reference to someone who may be taking advantage of everyone. Like, how do people really know unless they catch someone uh, really taking advantage of them? They may not know they've been taken advantage of, especially in a new place where they don't know what things should cost. They don't know how long things should take. They don't know what the processes really are. They just don't know. So it's very, very important that you find trusted resources. And the best way is to have a community. And the same thing, no matter where you go, if we're talking about Americans coming to Nicaragua, or Nicaraguans moving to America. The same thing is true. You are easily going to be treated as a target, even by lawyers, even by real estate agents, even by doctors. Anybody is going to say, Ooh, this is someone who doesn't know. And they would, they don't know what it should cost. They don't know how long it should take. And, and not that they will necessarily completely take advantage of you, but they may not give you all the same service that they would give someone that they think has more knowledge, connections, and resources and, and basis for comparison. So by becoming part of a community, getting to know your neighbors, getting to know the, the shop on the corner, being a contributing member of your little tiny society, when something happens, whether it's something simple or unforeseen, whether it's medical or legal or transport or whatever, or just simple things, right? How do I do this thing? How do I find this place? And so often having, I've spent time in uh, enclave type communities where it's all expats and they're just, everyone's like, I don't know where to go for that. And then you stay in a little community, in a barrio, and you get to know your neighbors and they know where everything is because they grew up here. They have all that stuff. And so 
you know, the same thing would happen. If you were moving to America, you would need to get to know Americans and they will start to share with you this tribal knowledge, as we call it in, in the IT industry, um, of, of what you need to know to live in a place. And without that, there's no training resource that just hands you all this knowledge and says, here's what you know to need to know and to be an expat here. It's just, it would be a huge amount of information. It would change constantly. Some of it's opinion. A lot of it is stuff that no one has ever articulated before because no one's ever had to. They never thought about it. And you put that all together and it's like, wow, this is, an, this is a huge, huge amount of stuff. And so people that I find being really successful and feeling safe anywhere, we're not talking about any particular country, US, Argentina, South Africa, Laos, doesn't matter. The people who tend to feel safe and confident are almost always those who have become a part of society. Of course, it takes time, right? So get moving, right? Speak the language, get to know people, uh, you know, intentionally make friends. I mean, that's kind of the process, right? Be social, make friends. You're an expat. You're normally interesting most places that you go because you're not the norm. So some people are going to be like, I don't want to meet an expat. That seems boring. But there's always going to be someone who's like, someone from somewhere else, that's different. Cool. I'll, I'll talk to you, right? It's a great icebreaker much of the time. And so uh, becoming a part of a place and becoming known by your neighbors and a fixture in your community and, and a positive member of your community, the same as if you were local and doing those same things, will empower you to have the resources, to have, you know who to ask and have conversations, uh, understand how things work, just learn about a place in really deep ways. And in a recent uh, set of videos that, that at this time are just beginning to come out, I know tons more are coming, so I have no idea what the end is like and a lot of people have sent them to me. If you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. And in those videos, the first thing that really struck me is this, the amount of time that they had been expats in Nicaragua. And yet the things that they were surprised by are things that you would normally expect expats to have learned about and understood within their first three to six months. But they had been here for years and complete lack of resources. I'm not sure how they didn't have those resources. I'm not sure what uh, processes they went through uh, during the years that they were here that left them without those connections. Typically expats would just naturally have some of the resources that they didn't have. Um, in other cases, just, just being in a place for a while, you generally have those things. But but I think a lot of it came down to they lived in a in an enclave and they were, you know, it's a family. So they spent time just with themselves, I assume. So they didn't really make the connections that uh, that you would expect. Right. Um, in, in places where where we've lived here in the same country, wherever we've lived, we know all of our neighbors. We know all the people down the street. We know the people at the bar. We know the people in town. We have we have you know, resources. And I'm not saying resources. We know people. So when something happens, for example, so this is a great moment to discuss this is uh, we recently had a truck, we think, hit the cable, uh, the power line that ran to our house. And it, it didn't just tear down the power line. It shorted out the, the post and the whole thing exploded. So we just happened to be sitting outside, just happened to be at night. It was an explosion. It was an arc. The power went out. Flames. It was wild, right? And because... Uh, one, we had enough people, uh, two of us ran out into the street with flashlights and started stopping traffic because the cable was hanging at chest level. So anyone on a motorcycle was dead, guaranteed. There was, even if it was, even if the electric was gone, there was no surviving it. So we had to stop every single vehicle. So, but we knew to be out in the street doing that, but we also were able to immediately call someone who was able to get emergency services moving and, and police and everything underway. And we had support people like we actually had our lawyer uh, was there with people at our place in five minutes just to make sure we were okay. Like she was just checking on us. <laughs> she didn't need to do anything, right? But she had coordinated uh, because we had called the police. We couldn't reach her. So we called the police. They were like, we know where she is. They called her. Uh, to let her know, but people were making connections really, really quickly. And then, you know, the fire department got on the way, the police got on the way. Uh, so we were just out there waiting for them to get there, but uh, it was minutes, right? With a, with a relatively minor event, but I mean, it could have been life-threatening. So people needed to react, obviously, but it wasn't threatening to us. We were just helping with the situation, but just making a call, we were able to get multiple resources locally underway, spreading the word in minutes. And, and everything was fine. No one got hurt, uh, you know, and they got the power company out that night. I'll tell the story elsewhere about how 
you know, well it went getting it repaired, how fast services were there uh, and everything. And, um, you know, our amazement at getting all new poles, all new power, all new fiber, uh, all done um, in, in, you know, I don't know, 13 hours or something. It was, it was pretty impressive. Um, but it was a great example of these are, you got to, you got to know people, right? You can't be, it, it, you don't live that isolated. It's just not a healthy way to live. It's not a safe way to live. It doesn't matter where in the world you are. You can live in Manhattan and you need to have some amount of knowledge of some amount of neighbors and some amount of people in your community. You need to have a social network for safety, whether it's someone to watch your kids or someone to, to help explain, you know, flights or shipping on something or taxes or there's so many things in life that you just don't know about. And it's uh, it, truly amazing to me, honestly, that humans function the way that they do, that everything's so informal. There's so little actual means anywhere, right, to tell you how the world works. Everything has to be taught to you as a child, and some amount of it is from school, some amount from your parents, some amount from your community, some from trial and error. And it's like, you know, how do you actually learn and know and trust the the things that you that you do it's actually a really complex process that is not formalized and and has very little means of looking it up if you were to say oh do you actually have to you know obey the speed limit oh well let me just go look that up oh wait no it's not that easy right it's it's quite complex and then you say well okay so this pamphlet from the DMV says I must follow that. Okay, but when you talk to a police officer, they're like, well, no, you can go a little bit faster. Like there's a little bit, there's like all these things. And you're like, oh, this is a really complex set of, it's not really the law. It's just kind of the law. And if you grew up like I did in New York, then you have this native knowledge that nine miles an hour over the speed limit is still the speed limit. But 10, that's where it becomes a new thing. And 30 or 35, that's where it becomes yet another thing. And you have like these tiers, but to some degree they're informal. And so you have to know that you're getting it from a trusted resource. You have to get it from multiple resources. You have to observe people testing that and then uh, uh, you know, build the knowledge that this is how it works because no one's gonna write it down. No one's gonna officially say, no, no, no. yeah, of course, all the, the speed limits are off by nine miles an hour. They're never gonna say that to you, but you learn that by being there. So the same thing is true everywhere. And so the more that you put yourself out there, the more that you are learning about a place, the more you are involved in a place, the more that you are connected to the people in a place that you become a part of your community, you're gonna, you're gonna join that curve and very quickly get into a place, yeah, you're always gonna have a little bit less than uh, whoever grew up there. It's just the way it is. But as long as you're becoming part of a community and you're getting to know people and assembling resources, for example, the one, the things you gotta have a GP, you gotta have a lawyer, uh, some of those, like for just anybody, you should have those things. That doesn't mean you're talking to them every day, but you need to have someone who knows who you are, knows your situation, is trusted, has been tested as soon as you can, and, and so forth. Now, for a lot of people, you're going to be doing business here one way or another, whether it's just for your uh, residency or you just want to do a little, little tiny business on the side, or it's you really want to be an investor and that's why you're coming. But a lot of people just end up being investors for one reason or another. All those cases, you're going to have lawyers and accountants and, and bankers and all those things all of that it will help build on stuff but this also highlights why it's so easy to get really really wacky ideas when you're looking at investing right i'm not saying you shouldn't invest but so many people when they come to me and say hey scott do you think this is a good idea and the thing that they say is it's so obviously to someone who's been here, to someone who's aware of what Nicaragua was like, not a viable business idea. Either it's been done a million times or it's failed and no one is interested or it makes no sense in the market or someone else would crush you because they could do it easier and better, whatever. A lot of those things, it's like if you become part of the community, yeah, I'm not good at picking out what businesses are needed here, but I'm really good at picking out ones that won't make it because I've lived here long enough to know what is out there that, that maybe you don't see sitting on Main Street. I know what people are asking for. I know what people have tried and failed, right? Because I have some of that experience. And so um, it's so important when you're looking at getting into business anywhere that you start assembling. This is the same kind of set of knowledge that you expect to have, um, to, to expect to need 
when you're looking to do a business. Of course, it's a it's a larger set for business. It is a more complex set. There's some things that are very different, like what kind of foods do people like to eat. You don't need to know that uh, to be a good member of society, but you do need to know it to be a good investor in food service, right? So, so it's a little bit different, but it's the same basics that in order to live well and be successful, generally you want to be able to act like a member of society. Of course, you're an expat. You're going to be a little bit different. That's okay. And people expect that. But there's also a certain amount of, but you don't want to be completely isolated. It's okay if that's you're a recluse and that's what you want to do. And all you want to do is, is be around other expats. If even that, maybe you don't want to be around anybody and you're looking for a place that's going to let you do that. That's okay. You have to understand that if you were to do that anywhere in the world, there are caveats that come with that. You, you won't have the family and friend and community resources that are assumed to be things that people depend on. And just like if I lived in the US and didn't have any friends and didn't have any family, it would be really hard and potentially dangerous for me. And I would not have learned the things about how things work the way that I did. You're going to face the same things. So it's a choice. It's up to you. But understanding that this is a risk and one that you can mitigate, but it is often tied to enclave life versus non-enclave life may make that alone a different decision than you were anticipating because it does play a factor. And it doesn't matter whether you're talking Nicaragua or Costa Rica or anywhere, right? It's always the same. Enclaves bring their own risk. It's also, someone asked me this recently, why do the police feel that San Juan del Sur is more of a problem than other places. One, obviously because there is heightened crime. Two, there, there is actually, if you look, there's a, there's a really well-known amount of uh, uh, drugs and, and other things that are going on in the community that are frowned upon. There is um, the, the constant scams going on down there. It's become a culture of that. And so a lot of the expats are viewed very negatively, both by each other and by the community. Uh, in the enclave kind of lifestyle, they tr see, you have a feeling of not really contributing uh, to to the society the way that other areas do. And that's not necessarily true. It's not that there are people who, who contribute quite a lot, but they don't have that, that view. It's much more of a, uh, these are people who've come to live apart to just take advantage, not of the people, but of the place. Uh, and, and while they are providing good value to Nicaragua in many ways, they're not the same type of value as you get outside the enclaves. Um, plus, there's a, there's a pretty big tendency uh, towards there to be more problems in those kinds of communities because you have, for exactly these reasons, lots of people doing things that are probably often outside the norm, uh, who often aren't super well versed in what you're required to do, should do, expected to do, and so forth. And in the video series that we're, we're watching, for example, it's a, it's a perfect example. At every stage, at least so far in the videos that they've released, I'm, this will be coming out quite a bit of time. I'm sure she will have released many more videos by the time this goes live. But it's obvious from the very beginning, not only did they not have any resources lined up that you would expect, and they didn't have the tribal knowledge that you would expect, uh, even, even for where they live, but a lot of the what are you supposed to do next, they, they weren't knowledgeable of what to do. And, and it's understandable. You live in an enclave. How would you know? Right. If you're isolated and you're not talking to people and you're not learning from people around you uh, and you're not hearing about it and involved uh, in, in a more general sense, then a lot of these things are going to be first times experience is going to be when it happens to you. For most people, most things that happen first happen to someone they've heard about. They hear about it in the news. Then at some point it happens to someone they know, maybe a distant acquaintance. Then it happens to someone that they are friends with and eventually it happens to them. That's a weird way to put it, but it's actually true, right? You, you've heard of any tragedy, right? Oh, caught in a terrible snow, snowstorm, right? Well, probably the first person you ever heard of getting caught in a terrible snowstorm wasn't you. It was someone you, you saw on the news and then eventually you someone you've met had it happen to them and eventually someone you know personally it happened to them and eventually maybe it happens to you too same thing right you, you if you don't build up that knowledge by being involved you could be the first test case for every event that it's going on in your life oh i need to go shopping in managua do i know anyone who's done that nope i'm the test case i can't ask people oh something terrible has happened and i need to know what are my expected legal responsibilities? Do I know someone who's had this happen to them? Nope, I guess I'm the test case, right? And that, that's where it gets really scary because you have no idea what to expect, what to do, and sometimes you can't help it, right? Some things, no matter what you do, you're gonna be in that position, even if you're not an expat, right? I 
Never have had to deal with anyone who had their car stolen by the police until it happened to me in Dallas. What do you do, right? And part of it is contact the state Senate, right? Like you really got to take some action, get the news involved, right? Like that's seriously, I was on the news. I was in court. I got government officials involved and I did get my car back, but no one I knew was aware of this or had gone through it, but had just given up, right? And I was fighting the system. I was the first, everything that I did, I was learning as I went. And so that's something you want to avoid if you can, right? And so, uh, Yes, being an expat has dangers. Yes, you can mitigate them, but you have to decide what makes sense for you. And again, we're going to dig into these skills in the skills series, but I wanted to get this out a little bit. One, because there are some of these warnings that people should have. And two, a number of people have, like every few hours I'm being sent some of these concerns with a video that's going through a story of things that happened and of people I've spoken to and had a dialogue about it. We're all pretty much on board with the same thing. Like, yeah, tragedy terrible things happening. We're waiting for more parts of the story to know what all went wrong. We have a feeling it's going to get much worse, but it felt really strongly like there was a huge lack of basic resources, massive lack of, of knowledge of what, what is expected in the area, how things work, what you're expected to do, who to reach out to, when to do things, timelines, what actions to take, how to behave and so forth. And uh, things that we certainly would expect expats to have no problem dealing with in the maybe six months experience range, for people who had been here for a long time, it really was shocking their version of how little they were aware of how they needed to behave and what they should have had lined up and how they didn't have some of these resources. Just really surprising. But apparently there's ways to slip through the cracks like that. So really important if this, you're someone who might slip through the cracks like that, that you become aware. Ooh. Ooh, I could be taking on this risk that I didn't know about, right? Because how do you know about those risks? Of course, if you sit around and think about expattery the way that I do, then it might occur to you. But for most people, it will never occur to them until they see a story like this and they won't normally analyze it to say, okay, well, this is a terrible thing. And they'll just leave it at, it's a terrible thing and not look at it and say, is there a way they could have been protected? And no, to some degree there isn't. But to a lot of pieces, even in a little bit we've seen, there is a ton that could have protected them had they had the right resources. And I'm not talking like, you know, big connections. I'm, not I'm talking about just basic having your ducks in a row, things that we expect expats to always have in their first few months as part of the process of moving down, as part of getting settled in and, and knowing when and how you deal with uh, being able to stay. Some of those things are, are just things you're expected to have, like having a lawyer, at least on call, even if you don't talk to them very often. And it, we believe from what we've seen that all it would have taken was having a good lawyer that you worked with, calling them up, and everything probably, at least so far in the story, would have gone pretty much as it was supposed to. And everything came down to they knew it was someone in, a, in an enclave. They had resources in the enclave to help them with a scam. And they had layer after layer of scams being run because of the enclave. And it's the mixture of, we know they live in an area, and it's important from the story, right? For those who are, who are still watching and are wondering about our take on the story this far. They lived in an enclave area. It is an enclave area that is really, really well known for the scams being run by members of the enclave, by expats against other expats. They call it the expat pyramid scheme because basically expats who've been around for a little while will prey on those who are newer or less experienced. So because there are so many people in flooding all the time, but there's also a group of people who've been there a long time, there is a hierarchy and basically it operates under a don't ask, don't tell. And there, everyone knows that these scams are being run, but you have to live with these people as neighbors and the people often doing it are the ones who are going to be around for the long haul. And so what do you do? Do you, do you create problems or do you just look the other way? Because the people that are getting scammed quite often are just going to move on or they're going to learn and join the system. It's a difficult situation for sure. And it is extremely well known. So working with resources and using resources from the community is generally expected to be something you avoid. Once you're knowledgeable, you, if you're going to have a lawyer, for example, you typically get them from far away. 
right? Because they're they're less likely to have been influenced by that. And the Enclave famously provides re references. So if you find someone, you'll, you'll hear people all the time. I talked to 20 people, they'll know, no. I talked to five people, right? And they all said such and such a person was great and they trusted them and they were friends and all these things. And then I got taken advantage of, like, oh, I can't believe this happened. Well, that's really well expected down there. It is common and you'll see people who are, uh, there's a really big video out right now from someone, I don't know, maybe a month or two old, where two really well-known scammers are there talking about how they're best friends and, and referencing each other and building up confidence in each other, right? Because everybody doing this stuff has a YouTube channel as well, and they're all got marketing engines and they all know how to make it look like, uh, you know, that, oh, I just met this person. Oh, there's such a, a great resource, right? And they ingratiate themselves and they make it look really good. This is what a long con looks like. And so uh, everyone's got something to sell. Everyone's got something on the line. Everyone's in a position where they don't want to be exposed. Uh, so when you put that all together, you basically have an unlimited number of fake references for anybody, anything. And some people are honestly just unaware. And they'll be like, wow, I got a great deal on this house. They'll have paid a million dollars for a $150,000 house. Uh, they can't move into it because the HOA doesn't exist. There's no water. There's no electric. But they don't realize that they got screwed scammed and they're like yeah i talked to this guy he was friendly oh i totally trust him even though he just scammed them right and so you get these references commonly uh and very few people call them out on it and so they're in that position so they're in a place where that stuff's happening they're getting exactly the resources that you would expect to be given under those circumstances just layer after layer of things that honestly we've been warning about in many many videos um, but some things i don't think we've warned enough about and so this video and some future ones are coming to talk about things that you could actively do to protect yourself because most of us who live here outside the enclave feel that what we're seeing from the problems that they had arise yes so far everything seems like a legitimate problem like i'm sure all these things really happened but they were mostly pretty easy to have avoided had they not been in the enclave or were in the Enclave, but recognized that the Enclave itself was a danger and took some basic steps to protect themselves, it wouldn't have been very hard with normal foresight to have said, oh, okay, these are just resources we should have lined up. This is just a way we should behave. These are people we should know and make an effort of, of having them on speed dial and um, being a little bit more prepared for living in a place. Right, because if they were in the, in Canada, they would have had those resources almost certainly, or they could have gotten them really quickly. Uh, and and because they were in a new place, um, I'm sure it just didn't occur to them. That's why we wanted to occur to you that they had broken these social uh, safety nets that they didn't really think about that they had. For example, even if you don't have a lawyer, you're living, let's say you're living in Toronto, you've never spoken to a lawyer, there's a really good chance that your family or friends have one that they have worked with for a long time who would step in in an emergency and represent you at a moment's notice and that you could get information extremely quickly. And you would have all this knowledge of how to behave and do things. You wouldn't need a lawyer for nearly as many things. So that's a kind of safety net or a series of safety nets that you have that you break when you become an expat. And so you need to recognize that that is a thing that is affecting you and do something to mitigate it. Thanks for joining me. Get down, ask your questions, comments, and everything below. Let me know what things we need to put into future videos. We're definitely going to be making more of this. This is an important topic. And once all of their information from that story is done, we can talk about it more deeply. Like right now, the only thing we know is they definitely were lacking resources and they were really, really, uh, as if they'd only been here for a few months, right? For someone as famous as they are, uh, to have to have so little connection in country, so little knowledge of the place that they live in, is is it feels surprising for someone who lives elsewhere in the country. But I'm sure if you're in San Juan del Sur, there's uh, thousands of people who'd be like, "Is that's normal? Why would how would you possibly know these things, right?" But those like everyone I know here, not a single person would have those problems, right? They may have other problems, but they don't have those. All of those would have been easily dealt with. So thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe if you'd like to help support the channel and the work that we do here. You can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com. And as always, slash Scott Allen Miller. Almost forgot that for the first time ever. And I will see all of you tomorrow.